Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. On today's show, we speak with Sarah Wayman, Chief Growth Officer at Dentsu Aegis Network China. We talk about how brands have been able to be successful coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic by reacting swiftly and acting empathetically. I asked Sarah how marketers are responding to the epidemic, the impact it's had on their 2020 business plans, and how they are realigning in response to such an unprecedented situation. We also looked at how logistics and supply chain challenges are impacting marketers right now and in what verticals as well as the resilience being shown by both marketers and consumers. We talk about the impact on mainstream brand equity that the coronavirus has had tracking across awareness, quality, and reputation metrics. We also discuss the regulatory and policy landscape around marketing in China, especially with regards to the coronavirus and maintaining integrity so that products and services designed to help counter the pandemic are allowed to be front and center. Enjoy. The Chinese local brands are incredibly flexible in how they adapt new consumer trends in, in comparison to, to Western brands. Um, and what we do find is that, that Chinese uh, local brands um, and players tend to have quite centralized organizations. So their decision makers um, quite often are normally the founder or their direct appointments that are connected into the CEO. So they have a huge amount of immediate influence over everything that's related to the brand. And they're fully accountable for the sales um, that are happening. So once a decision maker is convinced of the importance of a new consumer trend and they've decided that absolutely, yes, that's the focus that they want to move in. So whether that's products or services or communications towards that trend, the whole organization responds at speed. And I think some of the challenges for the Western brands who have more multi-market and layered decision-making processes, is that they're just too slow. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about your background uh, and how it pertains to China and what you've been doing there. So uh, so I think probably my, my first confession that I would have to make about my move to China is that uh, it wasn't overtly planned. I didn't arrive in China having uh, studied uh, here before um, or had a, a huge connection into the into the marketplace. But I, I came, um, I'd been working for Dentsu in the UK for around about three years. And I'd been working on more and more international projects for different clients and was like, okay, this is, this is the time I, you know, I want to, I want to go and, and work and explore different markets and, uh, and an opportunity in Asia came up and, and then uh, China came up as a, as a result. And, and they said, how do you feel about being based in Shanghai? And I said, oh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Give me 24 hours. And, and 24 hours later, I was like, I'm in definitely. And I, I, I think something that has just been abundantly clear um, in the in the past five years since coming here in in 2015 is this is absolutely one of the most exciting places in the world to be doing marketing and I, and I think that decision that I made um, back in 2015 when I was evaluating the different options was that you know if you if you want to be at the forefront of where things are really changing and how you work with platforms and, and how consumer engagement models are changing, you're probably looking at, you know, either, um, uh, either North America or you're, or you're looking at, at China. And, and I, you know, I've had an incredible journey here over um, the past five years and working with an amazing team, working on some fascinating client uh, briefs. And, um, and I think for me, it's the, the diversity um, that is endlessly fascinating, and I, and I and I think also, you know, it's 
it's the drive that every client's uh, challenges are, are different. And having seen the, the journey here over the past five years as different technologies um, have come in and, and changed the, the landscape, you know, no client's uh, situation is, is ever the same. You know, the slowing growth over the past five years has changed the landscape again. And so when you're digging into working with the client and understanding their challenges, I mean, that's, that's utterly uh, fascinating. And it's, you know, it's, it's never boring. No day is ever the same. Your thoughts on which foreign brands are doing well in the PRC right now? I mean, I think the the interesting part is is looking at you know where where we are now and and you know as as we're speaking today we're um, pretty much kind of two months uh, in from the the outbreak of the um, of the coronavirus here which has just fundamentally um, changed how uh, clients are, are looking at the course of uh, of this year and I think you know from a from a short term perspective now of the the brands that are are doing well some really interesting cases I think where you see brands who are doing well well are the ones that are being really authentic and they have managed to stay connected to their consumer needs. So they're taking quite a utility approach to how they want to connect. So, um, so for example, um, quite early on in the outbreak, um, Lululemon, um, the, the sportswear brand, had identified that people weren't going out to the gym, they're not training, but they still really wanted to be able to um, stay fit and, and occupied. Um, so they were one of the, the first um, global brands to um, provide a list of trainers that were offering live streaming or um, short video workouts. Um, I think also, you know, some of the, the bigger tech companies um, over the course of the outbreak have done well. So, for example, Microsoft um, early on announced um, some packages for enterprise users where they would get six months of, um, of the free international versions of Office. Um, also, um, I think it was Pearson's who uh, have worked with schools to be able to distribute free online learning resources and I, so I think that that's that's the key thing it's 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 really over the past um, uh, period where brands that have been able to respond quickly and act empathetically um, have, have been the, um, the most uh, successful I would say also then looking at a, a longer term perspective I've certainly seen that there's a shift that when you're looking at foreign brands in China Preference shouldn't be presumed and being a Western brand used to be an advantage and I, I think in the past there was a, an idea that uh, Western brands would be naturally preferred because they were associated with high quality um, and prestige and, and that's just not true anymore. You know, there's such a diversity of, of choice um, and there's increasing premiumization in the market that Western doesn't equate to better and the, the Chinese brands that have come in have really worked very hard to change the perceptions of low product value and quality and they've got smart product design they're um, you know they've improved their brand image they act incredibly quickly um, to win market share um, and when you're looking at some of the categories over the past uh, few years uh, you know when you're looking at things like smartphones or even you know you're even looking at infant milk powder which was a, a sector that had been hugely dominated by the, the western brands after the, uh, the nutrition scandal, um, local brands are now coming back in to be able to gain um, market share. You see, you see that in electronics as well. So Madey, Greer, Hire, they're all leading growth in the, in the home appliance sector and they're, they're putting big pressure on the, uh, on the global brands who are still trying to compete, but, but are sometimes just a bit too slow. How are marketers in China responding to the epidemic and the impact it's having on their business plans and their responses to such an unprecedented situation? I mean, I think the the key thing that we've seen uh, right at the beginning of the, the outbreak was that brands were moving really quickly to be able to pull investment out of those areas that were most severely impacted. So, you know, right at the beginning, there was that shift away from looking at out-of-home investments and, and cinema investments. Um, also, there was that damage control of making sure that um, because the situation escalated so quickly over the Chinese New Year period, even though that that was traditionally holiday time and people are 
off. Um, we really had to respond to make sure that advertising was being pulled and, and particularly when uh, there was messages there around travel, really going back and checking those creative messages to make sure that they were, um, that they were still um, valid and, uh, mm-hmm. and weren't going to be damaging. So, so that was really the first stage of, of the response. Um, last week, uh, running between the, the 28th of February uh, and, and the beginning of March, we conducted a survey of 155 of our uh, clients and our client leaders across Dentsu Aegis. Um, and I think something now that, that we picked out was there are some challenges that the brands are facing. Marketers are now having to be concerned by logistics and supply chain issues. So, um, so for example, 20, 28% of them fed back that they had um, logistics issues which were influencing their plans, 10% on the, on the supply chain. Um, and 47% of them that we surveyed have had some really severe impacts um, on their sales um, uh, as a result of the, um, the outbreak. So that now means they're taking proactive steps to think about how they respond to the situation. So interestingly, only 7% of the respondents that we'd surveyed were stopping spending altogether. But we saw that there is a shift now into um, looking at how uh, creative um, and geographical regions were, were being changed. So, um, so that was 22% of, of the respondents who were, were shifting messages. Um, a lot of budgets coming out of uh, traditional. So uh, TV was... Uh, uh, a channel where uh, marketers were, uh, were were rapidly um, reducing their their spending, which was um, something of a surprise because of the uh, the fact that people had spent so long at home. Uh, but I think is a reflection that a lot of the programming changed its focus um, during that period. So whereas traditional TV suffered because um, some of the messaging and the programming was more informative in nature than entertainment focused, the online TV platforms um, uh, picked up uh, and, and, and that's been that shift there. Then I would say in terms of how consumers, are th- how brands are thinking about the way that they want to be able to use messages in that time, we see about a 50-50 split between marketers who are focusing on looking at branding messages and those who are now really pushing campaigns with a, with a promotional uh, focus. I think actually, and something, something else that would be was super interesting from, uh, from another piece of research that we did um, was actually looking at the brand tracking and seeing how US brands in food and travel have done quite well. So something that we picked up on was looking at the way that McDonald's have reversed their position um, versus the local hot pot chain Heidi Lau. So Heidi Lau closed during the, the outbreak. Um, that has had an initial impact on their um, uh, their brand consideration metrics. So um, uh, McDonald's have lifted by 6, 6.4% against Heidi Lau versus a, a previous year performance where they were, they were down um, 2.4%. So that's, that's interesting in that sector where that focus and I think that reputation that um, the McDonald's have around food safety has played well for them. Also for automotive, when we're looking at that sector, um, I mean, I, I would say, you know, February was the most horrific month that they've had for sales. And, and looking at that data, it looks like sales were down 90%. You know, nothing was happening. But at the same time, their brand index scores stayed firm. And across the top 10 brands, actually six of those automotives increased their appeal over the past month. And, and they were very quick to be able to respond and change the way that they were engaging. And, and we saw a re- really rapid use of how they were engaging through live streaming and um, uh, and, and different uh, cloud-based formats um, to be able to, to capture um, uh, consideration and engagement with consumers. The baseline or normal has shifted. What does the rest of 2020 look like for companies and what can companies do with their three-month-old yet already outdated marketing plans and budgets to catch up with the rest of 2020 and what it's going to look like? 
I think the first change that we're seeing now, uh, and that was reflected in the, the survey that we've made, was that 61% of the clients that we were talking to have already started proactively making short-term changes. So those short-term changes now are around those changes in messaging tone, looking at platform selection, making sure that content is focused and, and appropriate mm -hmm. for the current situation. Long-term wise, looking at how budgets are going to change for the course of this year, I think there's an interesting split. So, uh, so we still see that there's 20% of people that are holding out and they're just not clear yet. And I, I, I think, you know, that's entirely sensible. The global situation is, is still in flux. Um, as I touched on, there's only 6% that were stopping spending so far. I think we will see inevitably in some areas a downward pressure on the marketing budgets for this year. What's more important now than ever, and I think something that we're working uh, closely with clients on, is thinking about how this shifts consumer consumption behavior um, and how it's changing consumers' uh, mode of, of communicating with each other and, and what they're looking for. Um, so certainly something that um, I think we'll see a lot more of is um, just that continued growth into uh, e-commerce, that, that landscape will continue to, to grow um, and change, um, that changing dynamic between online and offline services, um, the role and influence of, of social social commerce, um, I think, will uh, will continue to, to peak throughout the year. And, and I think particularly as we're looking at that nature of social commerce around trusted advisors is going to be uh, an, an interesting area to be able to um, to develop uh, and, and grow. But I think the key thing for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the rest of the year and, and looking at those plans is that brands now really have to, as we start to turn the corner in China, um, and the containment processes have, have been successful, is thinking about how to plan for that bounce back, how to, um, uh, how to be part of, um, of that story. And, uh, and again, I think you know, e-commerce e festivals um, will be a, a key part of that. Um, CRM is going to be really vital, you know, thinking about how to be able to build, listen to data signals that your consumers are uh, giving you, being able to respond to those uh, appropriately. So, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting year ahead. Are you advising any of your clients ahead of time of any potential strategies that they may want to employ once the markets return and the consumers return and the blood starts flowing again? Yeah, absolutely, and and I would say you know there's a there's a a, a a big percentage of clients who are already well stuck into making those uh, proactive plans uh, with us and and thinking about how to be able to to respond ahead. Um, I think the the slightly unknown factor at the moment and and where this you know the predictions still remain in flux um, when we're looking at making the predictions for um, advertising. Space Ending in the, the rest of 2020 is going to be driven still by what happens at a global level and that agenda. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the biggest uh, areas in, in that respect will, um, will probably be for China looking at what happens with the, the, the Tokyo 2020 games, because um, that's predicted to be a, a really big driver in terms of TV audiences and online viewing audiences, because uh, in comparison to Rio, there's just that hour's time difference between Tokyo, um, and particularly coming on the, the back of the, the outbreak. I think there's that, that potential there that Tokyo 2020 does create a strong shift and turn in momentum for um, for the rest of uh, rest of the year. How are logistics and supply chain issues challenging marketers right now? I think it's the key thing at the moment that's being impacted for for logistics and, and supply chain is uh, is where we look at markets like uh, automotive, uh, and 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 it's the manufacturers that have um, large sites in in Hubei that are going to struggle the hardest. And I, I think when we're looking at the rest of China um, now, the situation when we're looking at the the numbers for new cases is really under control. The governments in uh, Shanghai and Beijing and Guangzhou 
know as the kind of the key um, big tier one cities have really rigorous processes in place to be able to uh, to control uh, the uh, the continued spread of the, the outbreak and, and how they manage people coming in but you know when we look at the fact that there's 60 percent of, of light auto production that's located in the most seriously affected provinces that's a huge challenge and uh, you know we see that going beyond borders as well um, and impacting international supply chains I think that's uh, that will still have uh, impact as we move into uh, into Q2 uh, and hopefully that situation in, in who they respond um, vice versa you know something that's been a challenge for manufacturers across China and we see that in the south of China, looking at the connections between, um, for example, between Shenzhen and Hong Kong is where you've got garment manufacturers. Um, and it becomes more of a challenge when you're having to deal with the fact that there is the, the 14 day quarantine periods that are, that are taking place. So that's that's causing friction. But I also think that there's a certain amount of resilience that we're seeing from uh, from marketers uh, and from consumers in how they deal with that situation. And I think something that was interesting that we picked up from the survey when we're looking at the fact that marketers are having to now address different issues, you know, logistics and supply chain came up as their um, their two concerns so that was you know 28 percent there and the 10 percent but actually just one percent were worried about cash flow and I, I think that's a that's a really big testament to the um, the quick government response um, and the liquidity that's still in the Chinese um, banking market and an, an immediate response that was seen from the the China Banking uh, Commission um, to make sure that the impact on small businesses was cushioned um, and they were focusing on being able to issue uh, low-cost loans you know for example in uh, in retail and, and property uh, one of the uh, the leading uh, mall and, and retail commercial uh, uh, real estate spaces has offered relief for, for February so there's a concerted effort I think that people feel like we're uh, we're in this uh, we can uh, we can fight it together and um, and making sure that there's the the the, the infrastructure uh, to make that happen and, and, and to be able to create the, uh, the right base now for a, for a rebound. Sarah, what industries are going to rebound faster and which will be slower and why? I would say that one of the quickest rebounds that we're going to see uh, will be the, the the food, beverage, and entertainment category, uh, and that was something that came clear from some different consumer polls that we'd run. Um, and I think when you talk to people here as well, uh, you know, the thing that people are missing most is this desire to be able to be social, to be able to go out to restaurants, to be able to see their friends, you know, to get back into the gym and do fitness classes, you know, and also to go shopping. So. I, I think once we shift into the, the new normal, there's less of a, a focus on the 14-day the quarantine periods within China. That will that that desire comes back. That consumer confidence remains uh, remains healthy from the indicators that we're seeing so far. Um, for me, the year ahead, the industry that's going to be hit the hardest, unfortunately, I think, is, is travel. And we're looking at that global escalating situation. You know, for for the airline industry it's going to be painful and you know when we're um we're looking at the data so far you can see that you know 70 percent of trips have been cancelled the escalation um that's happening on a, on a on a daily basis the um you know the the, the travel industry i think will will struggle to be able to to pull back um really before uh, the the latter half of the the year uh, just because the um the, the corresponding actions globally now are, are making that um more of a uh, more of a challenge and, and i would also say that you know i think something that we will watch closely and will be really interesting is the longer term shifts for uh, the Chinese travel industry and the plans that, that Chinese consumers make for trips um, across Asia um, uh, and, the, and the rest of the world. Um, and, and I think it's probably in some respects too early to be able to tell on that. Um, something that did seem to be positive that we saw from uh, research that we'd looked at from 
YouGov was that consumer attitudes uh, and some brands had actually still managed to increase their shares in visit intention um, over the past two weeks. And I, and I think that was something that was quite a surprise. So, um, so for example, um, Disneyland Hong Kong and uh, Shanghai um, both saw spikes of, uh, of nearly kind of 2% in their intent, um, whereas uh, destinations um, like Macau actually dropped by uh, 2% across the, the same period. So, um, so certainly it's kind of some indications that uh, family vacations um, will still have growth later on in the year. Sarah, are we seeing any fundamental changes or even light changes in the way that marketing is being regulated? Are there any new policies? Is there a new watchful eye watching over how people are marketing in the wake of the coronavirus? I wouldn't say that there is a, a new watchful eye. I think something that we've seen and has been very clear from the um, from the initial outbreak in January um, is that focus on on making sure that the flow of information is uh, controlled and accurate. So, uh, so for example, on the 12th of February, um, we saw that the authorities had strengthened some of their controls um, over advertising policies during the, the epidemic period. And, and that was really specifically focusing on uh, making sure that there were no false claims being made. And, and, and the restrictions here already around advertising and particularly pharmaceutical advertising um, are, are pretty robust. Um, so this was really a, a, a new directive that, that just absolutely clarified that situation. Um, and the focus that we've seen is making sure that um, businesses and brands can't try and, and launch uh, products or promote products that would capitalize on the impacts of the virus uh, or make claims or suggestions um, around relief that hadn't been uh, approved or uh, or were accurate. So, um, so that's certainly a, a, a focus that, that we've seen from an advertising perspective. I would say from an interesting logistical perspective, there's also the growth that we've seen in the way that authorities are being able to respond to the situation by using technology in a really smart and interesting way to be able to, um, uh, to look at how uh, people's um, health uh, tracking and, and situations are, are being monitored, and uh, we've seen that um, in the way that you can uh, you can now scan and, and use a, a mini app um, to be able to track your health uh, status um, uh, to make it uh, easier to be able to um, to move across the city and, and access buildings, um, or for people who have returned back from the highly impacted areas, so for example, Korea, um, Japan, or, or, or Italy, um, being able to, to track and measure health status um, based on their entry or exit uh, records at, at ports or, or airports in China. Has the coronavirus had an impact on brand equity of mainstream brands? Uh, and can you speak to which ones and, and across which sectors? Yeah, so we had a, a look uh, at the four weeks moving average um, in February for a number of the, the key brands in China. And we've been tracking that across awareness, quality and, and reputation metrics. And actually that that, that result is, is positive. Um, there's been a limited impact so far um, on key brands. The biggest drop that we saw um, when we were looking uh, at, a, at a broader pool was Air China, um, who dropped by um, just over 10 points um, at, the, at the latter end of the month. Um, in comparison, when we're looking at the, um, the health metrics, um, there was some really strong gains made by uh, Taobai, by the e commerce uh, platform in China, looking international brands, um, again, across that period, um, travel brands, Shangri-La held its own. It had a, a pretty steady performance, tracking marginally down by a few percentage points um, in terms of, uh, of, of quality, um, but still maintaining its score on, on reputation. Um, KFC, despite the fact that it had to make the decision to, be, to shut a number of locations across China in the period um, enjoyed really stable growth across um, all of its, its key metrics. So I think, again, it's, a, it's an indication that 
consumers are not uh, they're not panicking um, they're they're resilient and, and and they are going to be you know ready to uh, resume uh, activities in in the near future Sarah what is brand index and how is it measured so brand index uh, when we're tracking it is an overall score um, and that looks at, at six different metrics that are that, that combine uh, together to that to that overall impression so we're looking at brand impression so this is really thinking about do people feel positively or negatively about that brand we also look at quality metrics. So this is how consumers respond um, about whether they feel a brand offers good or poor quality. Um, we also track on value, again, looking at, at, at that range in the way that consumers would score. There's a connection in there for satisfaction, um, which is really important. And I think, you know, particularly when we're looking at the, the Chinese consumer uh, in, in general, um, uh, their shift into e-commerce, they're some of the world's most demanding consumers. So satisfaction um, is something that can really drive opinion up or down um, quite quickly. Um, and then we look at, uh, again, recommendations. Would you, would you recommend the brand? And this is something that, um, that falls into some of the tracking that, that brands would do themselves around looking at their ongoing um, net promoter score. Um, and then finally, that also brings in um, brand reputation uh, scores. So um, would, you, would you feel proud or embarrassed to be able to, um, to work for the brand? And, and I think something that's been interesting to pick up in China um, over the past 12 months um, uh, is that this idea of, of do you feel um, proud or, or embarrassed, this tone of voice that brands have um, needs, to, needs to be really closely connected into uh, the culture and the general conversations um, that Chinese consumers are having and that there is a huge potential to make a misstep um, if you get things wrong in that area. And, and I think that's where you really see that brands are successful in, in China when internationally their global teams are closely connected and, and listening into their, uh, their local teams to be able to get those signals so that those communications come across in a, in a really authentic uh, uh, way and, and, and there's that connection between your brand tone of voice and, and what you stand for, your product appeal, but also how you're communicating that um, in a way that, uh, that, that talks relevantly to your consumers. Zooming back in on the last five years, your role and your body of work in China, how has the industry of marketing and communications networks in China evolved? And is there a competition with local firms? Where might the Western firms or Western focused firms fall short or perhaps excel compared to their Chinese local counterparts? I think something that we, we really see um, and taking a, a broad view, you know, the, the Chinese local brands are incredibly flexible in how they adapt new consumer trends in, in comparison to, to Western brands. Um, and what we do find is that the Chinese uh, local brands um, and players tend to have quite centralized organizations. So their decision makers um, quite often are normally the founder or their direct appointments that are connected into the CEO. So they have a huge amount of immediate influence over everything that's related to the brand and they're fully accountable for the sales um, that are happening. So once a decision maker is convinced of the importance of a new consumer trend and they've decided that absolutely, yes, that's the focus that they want to move in. So whether that's products or services or communications towards that trend, the whole organization responds at speed. And I think some of the challenges for, for Western brands who have more multi-market and layered decision-making processes is that they're just too slow. But that said, I, you know, the situation isn't all bad. And, and I think some of the most successful global brands in China are, are those that have still managed to be really authentic and relevant with how they engage with their consumers here. And, and I think if we look at uh, the developments that, that one of our clients uh, has made, so Coca-Cola across their portfolio is a, is a great example. They've continued to evolve and connect with young consumers. So um, if I think back to last year, um, in September, um, Sprite ran a campaign here that was called Mixing Like This, and, and that was around celebrating the launch of two new flavors that had been co-created um, with a Chinese uh, Baijiu brand called uh, Jiangxiaobao. Uh, so combining Sprite 
Nights and Baiju had been widely circulated as a, as a local cocktail. That was something that we picked up on when we were um, listening to the discussions that were happening in social media. Um, and that then triggers the launch of a, a Baiju flavored non-alcoholic Sprite and a, and a lemon and lime flavored uh, alcoholic Baiju ready to drink soda. And, and so I think we, when you're looking at, at Coca-Cola, they're really, they're really smart in how they're able to take those learnings from China and apply them globally. And, and, and that's, um, they have a, you know, a really strong uh, local team, but also the way that they're able to test global programs here. So again, their model has continued to evolve and they're looking at how they embrace that shift into e-commerce. So, for, you know, for example, when we take the 11.11 um, sales festival in November, which is just an absolutely huge event, um, you know, it's a must-win time of the year for, for marketers. Um, and and, and Coca-Cola have continued to adopt their approach to it. So uh, one of the, um, the programs that they launched um, over the past two years has been, you know, a project that really looked at how they were leveraging data to connect with five different consumer groups, um, making quicker strategic decisions, automating processes. There was a huge amount of personalized content that was created um, at scale. You know, it's a totally different campaign to, you know, maybe, you know, three or four years ago when, you know, there was just a, a really big focus on driving awareness through, uh, uh, through you know, traditional TV. Sarah, what's your number one piece of advice for foreign organizations doing business in China? Uh, 100% uh, it's listen to your customers. Um, and I, I would say that being able to demonstrate an understanding of Chinese culture, thinking about how you drive positive energy um, to society is a great way for brands to be able to form better relationships here. And, you know, consumers are politically sensitive, you know, misunderstandings, disrespecting Chinese culture. You know, there's a big backlash that you'll face, not just from the government, but also on, on social media. And, you know, I, I think, you know, brands need to be cautious that, you know, they don't end up in the, the same situation as, uh, as, as Dolce & Gabbana did. Uh, last last year, and you know, brands that inspire support from con Chinese consumers um, have a, a real uh, potential to to grow. And, and I don't think any brand here should automatically look at benefiting from China's growth potential. You know, consumers are, are smart. Um, uh, there's increasing competition, so you have to think about how you're delivering real value to consumers, and that's critical for Western brands who are, are looking to, to cut through. And I think we've touched on it throughout the discussion this morning, and I, I would still say, you know, localization, authenticity, they're really key. Brands need to stand out for their product. Um, you know, they have to have a, a really close control over the quality of the service that they're offering, um, and thinking about about, you know, what they're doing differently and better when it comes to technology and, and consumer um, experience. And, and I think when we're looking at how we as a communications network support our clients in that area, um, actually for, for me, the, the summary when we're talking about how we deliver future-proof marketing more than anything else is just, you know, be, be brave and, and be curious. Sarah, your insights have been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.